This week we talked to international best-selling author James Autry. In The White Man Who Stayed, he shares the story of his cousin and personal hero, Douglas Autry, who was a champion for equal education in the Deep South. Here, James describes how World War II may have influenced his cousin's thinking. He saw a lot of action. He saw a lot of death. And I think somewhere in the midst of all that horror, the color of people began to make no difference to him whatsoever. Welcome to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline. I am your host, Monica Hadley, and with me on this lovely day in September is my co-host and mother, Caroline Kilborn. Hi, Mom. Hi. Another beautiful day, but, uh, you know, we're never satisfied. We've got to have some rain. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is true. That's for sure. And we are recording here in southeast Iowa, and it's been a little dry the last few weeks. Mm-hmm. Things are getting everybody. a little brown. Yeah. Yep. Farmers are farmers are worried. Ugh. So, Mom, what do we have for our listeners today, or who do we? Well, have? we have uh, we have <laughs> we have James Autry, and um, he's the author of The White Man Who Stayed. It's a biography, remembered, and of course, it's very um, uh, essential right now. What th- this book is because it it talks about things that. People need to know about the uh, the South, the White, and the Blacks, and education. And this man that the book is about, uh, Douglas Autry, was a pioneer, a pioneer educator, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, a real champion. And of course, being a teacher, I I can sympathize with uh, you know with his efforts, and uh, it's really I, I was really impressed by this. Well, welcome, yeah. welcome to Writer's Voices, Jim. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'm glad you're calling me Jim, although <laughs> my, on the book all the bylines say James A., but that is Jim true. is what I... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, Mom, do you have a little more background on Jim you want to share? Yes, I do. He is the author of 15 books, the most recent of which was On Paying Attention, New and Selected Poems, a farmer, excuse me, a former Fortune 500 executive and magazine editor. He took early retirement in 1991 and since then has been writing, lecturing, and conducting workshops on servant leadership in this country and internationally. He has consulted on leadership for such companies as Starbucks, Whole Foods, New Hope Media, and others. He helped establish a servant leadership academy in the Netherlands. For one academic year, he held an endowed, endowed chair in leadership at Iowa State University and holds four honorary degrees. So he's a he's an Iowa person too. <laughs> so, so Jim, early retirement in 1991. It sounds like you have spent more years working post retirement than, or as many as you did pre retirement. Is that true? That's absolutely true. Yes, I uh, spent 32 years uh, at Meredith. And have been retired for 25 and have been a very active retirement. And uh, I've, I've loved it. I've loved the retirement period, uh, quote, unquote, retirement period, because <laughs> I've gotten to do new things. I was in magazine publishing. I really felt I'd done everything I could do there and uh, wanted to write more. And But what I didn't know, you know, I, I spent all my life thinking what authors do is write, Correct. What they do is speak. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I, spent a, I spent a lot of time speaking and, and doing workshops, and uh, that, that's that been extremely rewarding. I still do a little executive coaching. I don't I don't go out and speak anymore, but I do executive coaching and have a few clients, and most of that's done on the telephone. Good thing, because I can't do it any other way these days. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yes, you're right, I spent – about as much time in consulting as I did in in uh, honest work. <laughs> well, I don't know for sure that this this is, isn't honest work, especially writing. <laughs> writing is hard work. You've written fifteen books. Have that all been since your retirement, or did some of them come before? Well, my first two books were poetry, and they were before, and then I. The, the next book, which become my, became also my first business bestseller, called Love and Profit, it came out just as I was retiring. So, yeah, you can say that most of them 
fact, all of them except two have been since I retired. And you kind of run the gamut here. You've got poetry, you've got business books, you've got memoir. Um, I think you have a children's book. Yes. Uh, this biography of your cousin. Did I miss anything? Did I, I miss some categories? So. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, I thought I'd be a poet. My first two books are poetry, uh, but, but uh, even my business books, Love and Profit, for instance, was a, co a collection of essays and poetry. The next one, Life and Work, was also essays and poetry. So I've managed to put those things together. And you're right. I've, I've sort of, well, I, I, let's say this. I, it's hard for me to focus in one area for any long time. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've really, uh, enjoyed being able to do what I wanted to write and and, um, and sort of been moved by what uh, things that interested me most, management and leadership, of course, and then poetry, and then uh, the history of um, of this this current book, the history of my cousin Douglas in uh, Mississippi, and it was the first biography, and then I had a memoir, but that was basically a business memoir called uh, Confessions of an Accidental Businessman. So I have sort of been I have sort of been all over the lot. <clears throat> and a, a some spirit man of many talents. <laughs> and also you've written some spiritual books as well. Yes. Um my my father was a Southern Baptist minister in Mississippi. Uh, I've managed to not be a Southern Baptist. Uh, <laughs> but uh he and um, I grew up in a, a setting in which there was an awful lot of God talk. And so uh, I, I got interested in, in alternative approaches to God and to spirituality. So I, I did a couple of books on that and uh, I wrote one called Choosing Gratitude. It became, <clears throat> you know, popular and people were told me that they were – using sections of it for their daily readings. So I said uh, to the publisher, gee, why don't we do a day book called Choosing Gratitude? And he said, I love it, I love it. <laughs> and he gave me an impossible deadline. <clears throat> so I talked to my wife, uh, who was a former senior food editor of Better Homes and Gardens and the former lieutenant governor of Iowa, and said, you know, you're a good writer. Why don't we do one together? She said, you just don't want to have to write another 365 little essays. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, we worked together. People said it's going to be hard on your marriage. It was just wonderful. You know, you spend every day looking for something to, about gratitude to write about. So we end up with doing this book called... Uh, uh, 365 days of choosing gratitude, and it's, it, it's evergreen. You can start anywhere in the year. You can start any year. So, yes, those two books back to back were um, you could call quote spiritual unquote or or uh, you know inspirational, whatever term you wanted to use. Uh, we've gotten a lot of feedback from people about those how they use how they use the. Uh, the readings and and I don't know that's that's very gratifying when people will take the time to say you know this book means a lot to me. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. that that's got to be one of the most rewarding things about being an author is to actually have a message and convey it in a way that yeah. people appreciate. Yeah. Yeah, so, indeed. So the current book, the white man who stayed, um, what? made you decide to write this story about your cousin? Well, <clears throat> he's, he's, he's a personal hero of mine. Uh, he's uh, about half a generation older than I. And he was a World War II veteran and uh, saw a lot of action in the Pacific uh, on a destroyer. And he came back and went to, was the first person in the family to get a, a college degree. He graduated from the University of Missouri and and started teaching and then decided to go back to his home state of Mississippi and see if he could get a job. Well, he ended up, excuse me, he ended up running for and being elected to superintendent of education in his county. Uh, his story, which I unfold in the book, 
is one of of uh, hero heroism. He is a personal hero of mine. Where he he saw what and we listen. I grew up in the segregated South. I never went to school in, a, in an integrated school system. It was all segregated all through, even through college for me. So it was quite a thing to see him embrace the need for getting poor black and white kids educated properly. So he took a lot of risks. He made some really kind of, well, maybe I should just read you the beginning of the book. That sounds like a good idea. Okay. So just let me read it from right from the book. I can make this quick. The facts are simple enough. Country boy goes to war, comes home changed, goes to college, moves back to Mississippi, home county, when selected as superintendent of education, makes political enemies, makes naive mistakes, gets set up, tried, and convicted to seven years in Mississippi's infamous Parchman Farm. Sentence suspended after 18 months, returns home, goes to work in a federal program to help poor black and white people, and endures harassments and cross burnings by the Klan, is supported by black community, and once again elected to superintendent of education, endures more harassment while overseeing school integration, retires, and dies. That's the first sentence of the book. Uh-huh. <laughs> wow. Pretty much sums it up. It pretty much but, does. But, and the thing that was <clears throat> like the, the left turn in there for me was that he got sent to that prison. That yeah. was a surprise. Yeah, and it, uh, it it was exceedingly unfair. He was a political enemy that uh, managed to set him up, and they, they got him for embezzling and misappropriation of funds. Well, what he did was he very naively took funds out of one account and transferred them to another account, in other words, to use to help the black schools, and that didn't sit well with the powers that be. And so they said that's illegal. Well, it really was illegal. He didn't know it, but it was illegal. And uh, so they got him for embezzling and uh, misappropriation. The misappropriation was a, a civil thing, and, and the school board was culpable in that as well as my cousin. And only one criminal offense, the embezzling, which was a laugh, but nonetheless they convicted him. Well, he he was convicted for embezzling six hundred and thirty-one dollars and and sentenced to seven years. Oh my! So it, it was a it was a phony thing. But I'll continue reading. But as my cousin Douglas always said, Faulkner wasn't making anything up. He was just reporting it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, because this, this, what makes this story so intriguing to me is how my family is all tangled up in it. Our family has such a convoluted role in this, uh, which is all, also part of the book. But there were five kids in that family. One was three of them were boys and two girls. And the two three boys were Ewart, E W A R T, which the British would call Ewart. Who was that? Was my father. And the second was Eland, E L O N D. That was Douglas, the, the, the hero's father. And the third one was the youngest brother, a young ne'er do well named Everson, E V E R S O N. And two girls named Ruvis and Valina. They have a very minimal part of the story because the the act the three main actors would be Ewart, Elin, and Everson, and of course Douglas, who is the, the son of Elin and the nephew of the other two. Now, what makes it so strange? Let me. Do, shall I continue? Yeah, please do. But yeah. first, I want to ask, where did those names come from? Well, my mother were... always said they came from the Bible, but I can't find them in the Bible. <laughs> I don't think so. I but don't you know there. There was a lot of what we would consider really unusual names kind of in that era. I think yeah. we had, yeah, that that never, you don't, don't hear about in history and you don't hear about in modern times, but, well, yeah. Well, 
Douglas is the main character. My cousin Douglas was named Harold Douglas. And his mother was a movie buff, although there were no movie theaters there. So she named him after Harold Lloyd and Douglas Fairbanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. does. Makes more sense than Elon and, 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 and Hayward. Anyway, uh, his, Douglas's father, Elon, who was a Mississippi legislator, a uh, white supremacist of the worst order, and uh, and then Everson was a young alcoholic, near do well, the younger brother. My father was a Baptist minister. He was a great peacemaker. He, you know, we we got to keep the peace, you know, <laughs> which of course was a, a peace that was grossly unfair to black people. But uh, one little anecdote: my my father was told by his deacons one time during the infamous infamous Mississippi summer of 1964. Well, Brother Autry, you know, the the, the uh, Negras are going to come to the church, we've heard. So my, said, my dad, who was, knew this was a huge crisis, said, well, let's just give them some songbooks and see if they can improve the singing any. Well, that was his way of, <laughs> that was his way of dodging any responsibility. Elon, who was in the Mississippi legislature and, and later... Uh, active in the community, he got beat in for, for his seat in the legislature by what he called dirty politics. The guy from up north came down, paid a lot of money, bought got, boat, bought votes, and ran against him and won. Well, that's his story. Eland, who had been the white supremacist, became so influenced by Douglas and what he was trying to do for the black community that Eland then sort of did a switch and ran for school board, became head of the school board, and helped get the schools integrated. Everson, the youngest brother, and I want to make sure you're listening carefully, a preacher, school board, and Everson was, became a head of the Ku Klux Klan in the county. I know, that was just wild. Did I say, did I say that Faulkner wasn't making anything up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, he, he was just he was just recording. So a lot of the story and a lot of conflict is there. And uh and it's and what's interesting is I'm just sort of a, a minor character weaving in and out of this story. I had to go talk to Uncle Everson once because my son Rick had started having seizures and I found out as far as part of family history that Epson had had seizures, and I wanted to talk with him, you know, because it could have been a hereditary thing. In it. So I went to him, and, and he ran a little restaurant across the square from Douglas's restaurant, which was members only. So when I walked in, I said, well, I'm not a member of Uncle Everson. He said, let me see your hand. I said, show you my hand. He said, well, that's white enough. You're a member. Oh. So oh, that yes. shows you the the environment down there in which here are these families we'd have family reunions everybody show up but <laughs> i always felt very very strange i by that time had moved to iowa and was working at better homes and gardens uh and so i would go down and be sort of on the periphery of what was going on but what i came to realize is that douglas was he was like a lone voice, a lone white voice in the midst of all this. Very few people were outwardly supporting him. They would secretly, but not publicly. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I began to realize that he was, he had stayed. I and my, some of my other white friends had left the South and left those problems and went off to the North to make our fortune, quote, quote unquote. And Douglas decided to stay. That's the, that's where the title comes from, The White Man Who Stayed. You're listening to Writer's Voices with Monica and Caroline, and our guest today is Jim Autry, author of The White Man Who Stayed. Uh, do you want to read a little bit more from that, from the beginning of the book? Yes. Um, we said that... Uh, Faulkner wasn't making anything up, I'll pick up there, which means no one person's story begins and ends with him. It starts generations before. 
and in the South, that this means everyone's story is somehow connected to the Civil War, or as we preferred to call it, the war between the states. There are those in Mississippi who still refer to it as the War of Northern Aggression. Our family had only one war story. It is told that my great-great-grandfather Jacob Autry rode with General Nathan Bedford Forrest, who was reputed to be a superb military strategist whose techniques were studied by Nazi Field Marshal Erwin Rommel. That connection has always intrigued me because Forrest also founded the Ku Klux Klan as Nazi an organization has ever existed in this country and an organization that plays a small role in Cousin Douglas' story. In our family, we learned from early childhood that great-great-grandfather Jacob was shot off his horse during a skirmish near the Tennessee-Mississippi state line. A Yankee, Yankee musket ball creased his forehead horizontally, making a bloody but superficial wound. He was knocked unconscious, however, and left for dead. When he woke, his horse was gone, so he made what I consider one of the more rational and intelligent decisions ever made by an Autry. He just walked on home and quit the war altogether. <laughs> Good for him. <laughs> the only evidence I have that this story is true is a photograph of a family setting in which great-great-grandfather Jacob has what appears to be a black horizontal streak across his forehead. I saw that photograph only once. So... Uh, Douglas's story is tied to that war. It's no, it's no different from mine except in one important way. Douglas stayed. I and many of my white southern friends left the South, not only to make our way in the cities of the North, but, and this must be admitted, to leave behind the hard job we knew was coming, of finally integrating the South and bringing it into the 20th century. We knew it would not only be hard, but bloody, perhaps very bloody. So that's part of the beginning. And Wow. Uh, so what do you think it was that in Douglas that made him willing to put himself through what he had to go through to do what he did? Well, that's a good question. I'm not sure I have the answer, but I have some speculations about it. He saw a lot of action. Did you know what the the picket line was in the in the, uh, of destroyers in World War Two. Uh, you're too younger. No, that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I don't even know myself, but uh. the picket line was a line of destroyers that was stationed uh, uh, near the Solomons to protect the fleet that was in the Solomons. So they would protect the fleet from the kamikazes, and you know what they are. Yeah. Right. Do, yeah. Yes. The, the suicide bombers, and uh, so my cousin Douglas was on a destroyer, and his job was to shoot those kamikazes down. He said many, many times he thought he was going to die because they'd be, daming, be aiming right for the destroyers. They'd be shooting like crazy and didn't know whether they were going to hit them or not. Finally did hit them. But he saw a lot of action. He saw a lot of death. And I think somewhere in the midst of all that horror, I think he the color of people began to make no difference to him whatsoever. Mm. So I'd, that's my speculation. He came back uh, so impressed with sort of the futility of war and so impressed with how equal every, everybody is, is when they are facing death that he just, uh, he just decided to do something. Also, superintendent of education, he saw how the, the black students and faculty and, and schools were just very, very substandard. And uh, he, as he explained, a lot of the, the black teachers had just sort of been given a degree and without, yeah. you know, having learned anything. And some, he said, some were excellent and some were awful. And he, what he was trying to do is sort of equalize the quality of the instruction as well as, uh, you know, get in materials. He would go to other school districts and take their discarded books back to the black schools because they didn't have enough books, and their books were very good. So, I mean, he was doing things, and, I, I, you know, I was just kind of amazed that he 
he's this young man in the community who was an up and coming politician and uh, what he was doing. So, he, and how was, aware of of all of this were you at the time? Just marginally aware. I was in college during most of it, and uh, and then I mean, I, there's a story in the book how I went and voted for him. <laughs> but uh, you know, he, most of this happened as I was in pilot training and about to be shipped overseas. So it's it came from talking to him and his wife and other people and the people and I interviewed a lot of the African American people. They just kind of worshipped him, and uh, but I was not all that aware. I was not not in the middle of it, but. Uh, no. Well, all of the controversy must have been hard on his family, too. Oh, it was. It really was. Uh, my my cousin's wife was run off the road a couple of times by Klansmen. His daughter, mm-hmm. he, his daughter stayed in the school even when it was just marginally integrated, mostly all black, and then they were sending the whites to these private academies. I've read about this in the book, too. Um explaining that these white academies, which had their names changed to Christian academies, uh, <laughs> don't get me started on that. Uh, they, they uh, you know, this in the midst of this, with the whites doing everything in the world not to have to go to school with the blacks, Douglas's daughter, Becky, remained throughout in the, in the schools. In fact, I write about her in the epilogue of the book because uh, she had to be brave, too. Oh, yeah. And And, uh, does she have any regrets about having to do that, or is she as proud of her father as you are? She's very proud of her father, yeah. And uh, she's she's still alive, of course. Most everybody else is dead. The mother is still alive, but Douglas and Uncle Elon and my father and that whole that passed on but um, may I read you the epilogue sure Um, while interviewing Becky for this story I told her that I had been disappointed that more blacks had not come to his funeral she shrugged you know she said that I went to high school when I was 85% black I went to the prom graduated and all that along with the black students we were friends the same way as any high school kids are friends but I've never been invited to a class reunion. Really? Why? Have you contacted any of them? Of course. I used to hear about the reunions and call and tell them I didn't get an invitation. They'd apologize, but I never got one, so I gave up. Are you angry about it? I used to feel hurt, but then I realized I'm just not on their radar screen now. I've, I've moved away. I'm lost touch and all that. But that doesn't explain it, I said, feeling a little incensed on her behalf. After all you went through together, you deserved to go to your class reunions. She looked at me and shook her head, her eyes reminding me of Douglas. It's okay, she said. Times change. Everyone forgets. And that's the way the book ends. But uh, I I still talk to her. We're still in touch. You know, there's no bitterness in her. She still has uh, a lot of those African-American friends. Wow. Um, so, what are the uh, schools like there now? Well, they're much better. They're very integrated. I, I graduated from the University of Mississippi. Now, why would he go there, you ask? Well, because I got a clarinet scholarship. That's the only reason. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I had three or four scholarships, but they were the only place that would let me take the clarinet scholarship but not have to major in music. So that's the whole story there. But, uh, <laughs> But I, I, I uh, at the University of Mississippi was completely segregated. We had all sorts of things. My, my only claim to fame was having written an editorial in support of progressive causes, that, and I was denounced in the Mississippi legislature. And, Whoa. And I think, oh, I thought, boy, that, that's my only claim to fame. I was denounced in the Mississippi legislature. So it, now... There, it's like a, they're, it's the the president of the student body at, at the University of Mississippi called Ole Miss has been black Miss Mississippi Miss Miss Ole Miss 
the beauty popularity contest has been a black girl a lot of black cheerleaders and and uh black office holders i mean it's and and interracial couples you know uh these and these are kids as i've told my wife these are kids they could have been killed if they'd mm. done this while they were when when i was in school there but wow. that's completely changed. There are more elected black officials in Mississippi than any state in the Union. So it's very well integrated. I mean, in fact, I could make the case that that there's a lot of northern states that are behind them. But there's still a, a fairly substantial number of section of the of the con of the <laughs> sorry to say congregation <laughs> population of <laughs> the population yeah that are just right wing and uh oh no this unfortunately let me tell you how why I decided to bring this book out now I wrote it 12 13 14 years ago when Douglas was still alive and um, and and publishers didn't were all that interested in it. Well, one of them said to me, "You know, this story has been told." So this year, when I discovered we had a president who was trying to make the world safe for white supremacy, I thought I will try the book again. So I sent it out. Well, the first place I sent it was to the Ice Cube Press, and they jumped at it, and so it's out now. But I didn't think it would ever be published because uh, people didn't seem to be interested, but they, they sure are these days. Wow. Um, I It's hard to believe someone would say this, that it's already been told, because it, stories like this need to be told more than once. Absolutely. Yeah. They do. And uh, I'm, what I'm hoping is I will get out and... Uh, in promotion for the book, if we ever are allowed to go out again, but in promoting the book, uh, I'm, I'm trying to make the point that that we society is going backwards now. We're going back to where the environments that I grew up with, which is filled with uh, prejudice and and hate and discrimination yeah. and. Uh, you know, it's. I've seen it change so much. In fact, if you went to the south now, you would you'd, you'd be very, very comfortable. Back during the Mississippi summer days, I had friends, white friends here, who were going to go back and and help register black people to vote in in Mississippi, and wanted me to give them contacts and people they could call in case of emergency, which I did. But Nowadays, I mean, it's, you, know, you hardly know there's any conflict except among the right-wing crazies. Although there's still a lot of voter suppression. and Oh, gosh, yes. Yeah. Maybe it's not taking quite as violent a form as it did in the past, but, boy, it's like any way they can get to keep people of color from voting it seems like they try from, um, you know, limiting the number of polling places to taking people off the voting rolls for no reason to requiring forms of ID that um, particularly a lot of older people can't, don't have. Um, yeah. Well, it's com completely unscrupulous. Uh, in the In the South... <laughs> It's not as quite as big a problem in the cities as it is out in the more rural and small town areas. But there are not enough city people that make much difference. I they, gotta they, wonder they, sometimes why people stayed, why the black people stayed. Well, there was a huge migration of blacks to the north after World War II, and what happened is they got put in ghettos and the neighborhoods were redlined and bankers would lend to them and they found they ran into a great wall of, of um, you know, re, uh, not just reluctance but out and out 
active discrimination up here. Right. And, and uh, so a lot of them went back. Also, there was what, what my friend, cousin Douglas used to call the grandmother syndrome. Uh, a black couple would be in the north and have uh, a child and, and uh, say a young man, who was most usually a young man, and it was always in, in some, you know, jeopardy of joining a gang or something in the north. So they'd send them back to the south. They would remember they grew up in this loving atmosphere, and and uh, even though there was discrimination, you know, they, I guess they felt that they had a decent childhood. So they'd send the kid back down to the south, and and uh, those kids would bring a lot of their habits from a the north with them and, and it, it created quite a lot of uh, uproar it's, it got very very complicated because uh, the north recommend, uh, represented to the African American people you know escape from discrimination well what it was was escape from an overt discrimination but there was still a lot of unspoken as, as we very well know it is still going on you know, right right you're listening to writers voices with monica and caroline and our guest today is james autry author of the white man who stayed which is a biography about his cousin douglas autry um jim tell us a little bit about your kind of writing um, routine? Like when you're working on a book, is it something you write every day or do you have certain certain um, rituals that go along with it? Uh, well, I don't have rituals really, but I, <laughs> I have habits. Habits, I write, okay. <laughs> I write in the morning. You know, I, I do better in the morning and by the middle of the day, I, I just set it aside. I think I do a lot of thinking and, and put a lot of mental activity in what I've written earlier in the day and maybe work on it the next day, but mainly it's uh, about three or four hours in the morning and, and that's about, I think, about all the crit creativity I've been injected with that day. <laughs> <laughs> so, and do you write on computer? Yes, I do. Except poetry. I write poetry by hand. Something about the rhythm of poetry doesn't work on a computer for me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. That so, makes um, sense. I, yep. I, I still write some poetry and, and uh, I enjoy the fact I've just been, just had published on BillMoyers.com a, a poem. Uh, actually, I'm reciting it uh, that I wrote for the. Uh, the the, uh, the, the, what, the mess we with the pandemic and the virus that we're going through and uh, people's response to it. Do you, do you want to recite that poem for us? I, I don't recite my poetry, but I read it. I'll read it. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> my son Rick, uh, he's a lawyer and a writer himself. He, he uh, said you I want you to write a poem for the for the pandemic. I said, Oh God, I don't write poetry on assignment <laughs> But but uh you know, there, I realized that all around me there was poetry and I just had to write it down. I wrote this little short poem called Messages of Hope for the for the Cynical World. They arise from chalk on city sidewalks from voices rising in song from balconies, creating impromptu choirs, from Westerners who venture outside and howl at the moon with the coyotes, from the syncopated city rhythms surging from improvised drums, all expressions of life and unity, all affirmations of our need for one another, all ways of saying stay well instead of saying goodbye struck me that we have we, we we don't say goodbye to one another now we're, we're we're so concerned about what could happen to this person before you saw him again so we end up saying stay well or be healthy or 
That's right. Yeah, yes. and we don't hug either. No, we don't. We've <laughs> been deprived of that. I don't know if other people have this experience, but like if I'm watching TV or a movie and people like go into a restaurant and sit down or they go up to somebody and get right up in their face, I'm like, what are they doing? <laughs> oh, yeah, I can, I can understand that. Really. I get really uncomfortable about it. Oh, well. Oh, man. It's, and of uh, course, uh, here we are all in Iowa, which has uh, the distinction of being like one of the worst states in the country right now for COVID infections. Yeah, but our president really loves our governor. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> we won't say any more about that, but. Yeah, that's true. Uh, <laughs> we, were, <laughs> we were, I was on a business call this morning with an a business associate in Mexico, and we were we were joking about Iowa being number one, and and um, and she said, "No, Mexico's worse. We've been worse." I go, "No, nah, I don't think so. I think we're worse." <laughs> we were <laughs> we were yes. competing for the status. <laughs> yes, we have competing. to joke about it because <laughs> yeah, oh, a dubious co reason a, for the competition. A, a dubious um, distinction for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um. What else can I tell you about the book about the South about my cousin? He was a he was incidentally he was a very very joyful guy, and had his own way with the language. He used the word bad instead of very, so he'd say, "Man, man that ch that fried chicken is bad good." <laughs> Just very. <laughs> I've heard I've heard it uh, mad being used that way. Also, that was that was a mad good piece of chicken. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so how did you know? How did he get over being in that prison? How did? Because that must have been really hard and also humiliating. Yeah, yeah, and he spent a, a, quite a quite a bit of time and effort over trying to come over overcome the embarrassment and humiliation of it the people who knew what really happened it was okay they knew as a matter of fact when he was re-elected uh, he was elected superintendent of education um, again it was almost unanimous because the white people were feeling bad about how he'd been railroaded and the, and the black community supported him completely but he had a hard time He he's, he's such a good-humored person that uh, in prison he, uh, he, he well in almost every state they have honorary colonels I don't know if you know this but but I'm a colonel in Iowa why am I a colonel because I gave a lot of money to I gave a lot of money to the current to the governor you know <laughs> so it's, it's a political deal so he the, he was a colonel before he got in prison, so all the prisoners began to ref, refer to him as colonel, and yeah. uh, it, it was all all very good natured. But he uh, now was the prison was, system integrated? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Figures. <laughs> and he, uh, but he he uh, he had a hard time in prison when he talked to me about it. It was just the, the worst period of his life and I wanted to write I wanted to get some, something out of his you know that he'd written about the prison and, and, but he never wrote a letter he never wrote anything his wife went and drove down there a uh, three hour drive every every week to see him and but he never wrote anything wow so Jim uh, you mentioned that you sent the book to Ice Cube Press when you decided maybe now was the time that it would be interesting, you know, would come out, and of course they snapped it right up. We've we've had a lot of authors from Ice Cube Press. It's a small, independent Iowa-based press. Steve Semkin's the yeah. editor there. Um, did you do? Did you have to go back and do much rewriting or editing at that point? No, I didn't. Uh, Steve had. A few suggestions, not much, and uh, and I went over the book carefully again before sending it to him. But uh, I, when I, I 
sent him a manuscript, and he called me and he said, I want to publish the book. So we did minor things, really, really minor. You know, unlike many biographies, I don't use any dates or or, or any of the technical things you find in a bi- biography. I have told it as just telling a story. You know, just telling the story of this man and his story, which is then amplified by some of the stories of family and then some of his co-workers and the people who worked for him and with him. So it, it's it's very much a book of stories, and uh, which is sort of my style. I'm not not given to doing much technical kind of writing, and. Uh, I have written one book which has some technical stuff in it, but that's <laughs> this, this is the only book. This is the only book I've self-published. Uh, the rest of them have been published by everybody from Random House to William Morrow and others. But the book that I self-published was was called the, "The Cold Warrior: When Flying Was Dangerous and Sex Was Safe." <laughs> It's based on my three my three years flying jet fighters in the Air Force in France. Uh, oh, actually, wow. it was in it was in for four years, but I, uh, and uh, so it, it's intended to be something of a spoof of military life. And <laughs> but uh, you know, you publish it yourself. There's no way to get anybody to buy it. You see, all your friends. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's pretty it's pretty raw. As I I refer to it as my only dirty book. Oh, <laughs> I I was wondering how you found out about Ice Cube Press. I it was kind of shot in the dark, uh, and I I, uh, I I just sort of decided I'd send it, and then but then I talked to a bookstore here in Des Moines, and they knew Ice Cube, and I realized that my my wife had one of the books from Ice Cube about the, the farm women. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, we did that interview. We interviewed that. On yeah, that the very high, very high quality. I was impressed with it. Some found one on their website and thought, gosh, you know, I'd be honored to have them publish my book. So I sent it, and, and I got a call one day from Steve Simpkin, and, and we took it from there. How did you feel? Originally, like when you started writing, how? Of course, you were came from the publishing industry, magazine publishing, but I imagine you had connections into book publishing too. How did you find your original publisher, and was it hard? It, it wasn't. Um, I had I had written this poetry, this quote business poetry, and I did a reading at a conference, and John Nesbitt, you know, John Nesbitt, who wrote Megatrends. Ah, uh, yeah. Anyway. He a great bestseller. He loved it. He said, I, I'm going to introduce you to my agent. So I met his agent, uh, Rafe Segalen, and Rafe said, you know, he liked it. So he sent it and couldn't get it published uh, as poetry. And and, uh, and then the editor there at, at William Morrow said, well, you know, if you had some essays and poetry, what happened, I had been writing some essays. So I kind of fell into that. And then after that was published, uh, uh, the uh, the uh, love and profit was was it. It became, to my amazement, a business bestseller. <laughs> you know, and, and I just, well, what did I do to deserve this? So uh, it was interesting. The first, the day the book came out, and I was supposed to go on a radio, a, a television program in Detroit. That's where the book was going to be introduced. That's the day the Gulf War started. Mm-hmm. And so, so here I am with talking and in, in this sitting with these people in in a circle at this talk show, and the guy who runs the talk talk show is like. My brother used to say a voice box with no brains. Uh, He was saying, well, Jim, I see you flew jet fighters. What do you think about those guys over there? What are they thinking now? (laughs) So so I said, you know, I said, well, I think they're pretty much concentrating on their job uh, and trying not to get shot down. Uh, But but uh, that was the the beginning. That was love and profit. And, 
you know, in order to get established in the book business, all you have to do is have one bestseller. And and uh, as I say, I thought spent all my life thinking authors write only to discover they speak. And next thing I knew, I was being asked to talk everywhere. And the people wanted to pay me money for doing it. <laughs> so, how <laughs> what's what's well, happening here? <laughs> well, how so, did you uh, go from from like growing up in small town Mississippi, the son of a Baptist preacher, going to be a fighter pilot? How did you end up in the magazine publishing industry? Did you start in the mailroom well, and? <laughs> No, no. Uh, I started, but I started as a low person on the totem pole on the staff. I was a copy editor. I, uh, I, <laughs> uh, you'll get a kick out of this, I think. I was, I studied newspaper journalism in college, and thought I'd go into the newspaper business when I got out of the Air Force, and I did. And, and but I was editor of a small weekly newspaper in Tennessee, and I wrote to everybody I knew who had a job. It's a, it's a possibility of getting a job. And uh, somebody at Meredith Corporation, which is better as a gardener, said, well, there's an opening for a, a, a salesperson out of Memphis and put me in touch with the director of sales. And he said he'd meet me at the Memphis airport for an interview, and he did. It turned out I didn't want to be a salesman, and, and uh, he, but he'd, he'd like to have hired me if I wanted to be. I said, no, I don't want to sell. I, I said, but... Turned out he had been a Navy pilot. I was an Air Force pilot. We talked about flying for two hours, and he offered me the job. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I turned it down. And he went back to Des Moines, and, and the manage and and we and he talked to the managing editor about Holmes and Gardens, who was a friend, a golf buddy, and said, "There's this guy down in Tennessee you might consider." That day. The copy editor of Better Homes and Gardens resigned because she wanted to move back to New York. I uh, interviewed and got the job. Talk about sort of dumb luck, sort of staggering from one thing to the, from one success to the other. <laughs> and uh, so I went to work at as copy editor of Better Homes and Gardens, and and I was became managing editor, and then I left and I went to New Orleans and became editor and publisher of a, of a city magazine, getting back to grassroots journalism, only to find out that I was changing the toilet paper rolls and making a cup of coffee. Uh, oh. <laughs> so when the Meredith guy came down and said, I'm starting a new division, I'd like you to take it. I said, well, it took me about 10 seconds to say yes. And I came back to Meredith in, in uh, 66. I was gone. I was only down there about 15, 16 months came back to Meredith and stayed with it then and became head of this new division of special interest publication at Newstown only. And then they asked me to be editor-in-chief of Better Homes and Gardens and then vice president of magazine publishing and then president of the publishing group. I just, I just went through all the chairs at <laughs> Meredith and... and uh, Finally decided that uh, I, I was not going to be CEO of the company. One, they weren't going to offer it to me. Two, I didn't want it. Mm. But I did. I did. Uh, and in the meantime, I'd gotten married again, and uh, we had a son who who turned out to have autism. And I was in New York every other week for 12 years because oh, wow. half of my staff was in New York. So I decided that I was going to take early retirement. And Meredith was very good about it. They didn't give me very much of a bonus, but they were very, good. They were very, understand, very understanding. And um, so I thought, well, I can freelance. I was doing a little bit of consulting. People had already come to me to consult for them, uh, but I wasn't doing it yet. So I thought, well, I'll go after that. And then Love and Profit came out. Bam. Wow. Uh, it's kind yeah. of like a fairy tale, Jim. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I say. Or, or you could say another another matter of pure dumb luck, <laughs> man, ill educated <laughs> southern boy. So, mom, before we run out of time, do you have some more questions? I wonder. I, I, some more questions? I wonder. I, I was going to tell him he really ought to write an autobiography because he well, has I, had an interesting, interesting life. And, uh, you know, all those jobs and, and, oh, yeah, he should really write that. <laughs> you know, I, I don't think I would be a, be a very good biographer. Uh, I love biographies. 
but I call this a biography remembered because I wanted to let people know it's just a matter of it's more like a, as much like a memoir of somebody else's life as it was a <laughs> technical biography. That's a um, that's a good distinction to make because sometimes. You know, people. Some people love biography, but some people think, "Oh, that's dry and boring." But um, a memoir of somebody else's life. I like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mom, do you have some closing words for us? I do. I I, I want this. I, this is from the book. Um, it's about it's about Douglas, and uh, it says he knew he would not be able to fulfill everyone's expectations, but he vowed to do what he could to help all the students in the county. If I stick to just improving education for the students and keeping the peace in the schools, those are the two most important things I can do. And I and to me, that's a, that's a hero. That's a real hero. It is. Mm. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Jim. And see you all next thank week you on. <laughs> see you all next week on Writers' Voices.